Hey, what's up, everybody? We have a new YouTube channel. Make sure you subscribe right now. Leave a comment on the video. Share it with your friends. It's also a podcast. Three and out. Wherever you listen with me, John Middlecoff, Apple, Spotify, we have you covered. As well as thevolume.com. We have merch. Check out. I got three and out hats right now. Thevolume.com. Search the podcast. Buy some merch. What is going on, everybody? John Middlecoff, Three and Out Podcast. A lot going on football wise. I've spent the last 24 hours just thinking about the games yesterday, the outcomes, the victors, the teams that got sent, you know, home to Cancun. A uh, lot of other stuff going on in the NFL. Television ratings yesterday were enormous. Greg Olson, no longer the number one guy because Tom Brady's coming in. And some thoughts on the Philadelphia Eagles coaching staff. Before we dive into football, can I tell you about my friends? my partners, and the official ticketing app of this podcast, Game Time? Do you want to get out of the house? Do you want to go do something fun? You want to take a son, a daughter, a friend, a wife, a, a, a husband, a father, a mother, and go to an event, maybe a concert, maybe a comedy show? How about a game? College, pro, you name it, any sport. No matter where you live, just download the Game Time app, type in either the venue or the area you live in, and see what's happening around you. And if you want to go to a game, buy a pair of tickets, promo code John. Promo code J-O-H-N, J-O-H-N, save $20. Cannot recommend it enough. I think one thing we've consistently seen in sports and in life, when you go through hard times, you are much more equipped and you're successful and you have a, you know, a history or you've had to struggle to get where you're at. It's easier for you to handle more shit in the future, right? I think when you look at yesterday's game, you look at the Baltimore Ravens. I'm not saying their season was easy because they created that. They played a ton of good teams and they dominated them. I mean, they consistently beat the piss out of everyone they play, which in theory should be a good thing. But ideally, you kind of like some uh, bumpy roads along the way. You like people to go, what's going on here? I saw Andy Reid had a quote today. Never forget, on Christmas morning, depending on where you live, for me it was morning, they got worked by the Antonio Pierce Raiders. The Raiders didn't complete a pass like the last 40 minutes of the game. The 49ers, that night, their quarterback literally lost the MVP and threw four interceptions. Hell, last week, the 49ers for 90% of the game were going to lose to the Green Bay Packers. They were going to lose the Lions, right? They have, and a lot of these core guys, have been through devastating losses, like last year, when they did not have a quarterback. Everyone this year, beside, you know, probably internally in that locker room, thought, you know, this is the year Chiefs probably won and done at most, a victory in the playoffs. Because rightfully so, you watched them play, they were losing games that they used to win. It didn't look right. The 49ers who looked, I would say, indefensible early in the season, then they had a three-game losing streak. Then they looked indefensible again, and then they lost that awful game to the Ravens. And it just made you question, like, are these guys that good? What's going on here? And then the Packer games happen. Like, what? What's happening here? And anyone listening to this, whether it's professionally or personally, when you go through shit, it helps you become better either professionally at whatever you're doing or personally, ideally, you become a better human. You think about things that probably didn't cross your mind before. I know for me, I had been fired twice, contract not renewed in the NFL, and then had my radio show canceled by the time I was 31 years old. I've lost a parent. Like, these are things that, in a healthy way, I mean, at the time, I don't care what quote you read. Like, there's no adversity. There's no failure. There's just learning. I mean, all that, it's like, okay, that's that's easy to say after the fact because it is true. But when you're going through it, it's really hard. Anyone listening to this who's been fired, who's gone bankrupt, who's had rough things happen professionally or personally, know at the time, it really, really sucks. But Once time separates from that, you can use that to really benefit you moving forward. And for me, with my father, I think about him every day. 
And I like to think because of that, I've become a dramatically better human being and strive to become better and better as I age. And those are things when they're around, the thoughts don't even cross your mind. Professionally, there's a drive anytime someone tells you, I don't care who you are, I don't care what you do. You're not good enough. We don't want you here anymore. Okay, let's take inventory. Five years, 10 years, we'll, we'll fucking, we'll, we'll check back in with each other. It's just human nature. And I think anytime a team loses, listen, I, if you win, the Eagles won all these crazy tight games, but you were watching it early in the season when they were 10 and one, you're like, this is crazy, right? And sometimes winning, not sometimes, when you're winning and you're not playing well, it definitely band-aids issues. It's much easier to coach a team up to, you know, yell at guys in, in whatever industry we're in when we're losing games or losing money, right? When things are going great, everyone just has a smile on their face. It's it's human nature, unless you're like Belichick or Saban, to circumvent problems when the end result is working out. And I think when you look at the Chiefs and you look at the 49ers, like they have a core group of guys who have just been through adversity, who have been through rough times football-wise. Right, It did not look pretty throughout the season for the Kansas City Chiefs. At multiple times in the playoffs, the 49ers could have waved the white flag and folded. And I think when you look at the Ravens, this that loss to the Chiefs, like I'm not, I've never been, like to me, Lamar Jackson became a dramatically better player this season that I ever thought he was. And he was obviously a very good NFL player. He won the MVP, but I'm just saying like a sustainable player. I listen, Peyton Manning had bad playoff games and depending on if they lose a coordinator or not, if they bring back both coordinators and the same team, like I think they're going to be pretty good. And I think that they can really benefit next year. It probably won't look as good as it does this year. That doesn't matter. No one cares what you do in the regular season. Once you're in a tie ball game, in the second half of a playoff game. it It's irrelevant. It does not matter. It's why, you know, how many people go to meetings and introduce themselves and the guy's talking about his accomplishments from 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Like, unless you're fucking Joe Montana or Michael Jordan, no one gives a shit. I, I don't care what you used to do in 2007. It, it does not matter. But it does help shape you. And that team, it, listen, they created it because they were killing everyone but they got into a spot where they kind of got hit in the mouth early and they didn't know how to respond. And they ultimately, as the game went on, they kind of crumbled. And the 49ers and the Kansas City Chiefs are kind of the opposite because now the games look differently, but in terms of their mentality of like, they're okay with having a rough stretch during a game. They understand getting down. Hell, the Chiefs or the Chiefs got down multiple times with the Bills the previous week. The Niners have been down in back-to-back -back games with their season on the line in the playoffs. And they had some devastating losses in the middle of the season. So I, I think when you go through that, you're much more equipped for the playoffs. Because, like, listen, it, it, we all can attempt to pick games once the playoff starts. I know for a fact it's never going to be easy. I've been watching the playoffs enough. I've seen number one seeds go down. I've seen great players lose. We've all seen it. If you've been watching the NFL for 5, 10, 20 years, you've seen it all. There is no guarantees in the playoffs. I don't care how good your record is. I don't care how good your roster is. I don't care if, you're, if your coach has won a Super Bowl before. It does not matter. It is not going to be something is going to happen. A fumble, a pick, a guy breaks his leg, something out of the ordinary. And it, there's, a, there's a tenseness. You feel it on your couch. You definitely feel it if you're at one of these games and definitely part of one of the teams. Because the moment you're like down three with – Three minutes left to go in the third quarter. You start going, well, how many possessions are we going to get left? This is a big drive. It's it, it, Those thoughts don't creep into your head week seven when you're, you know, six and one. It, it can't because there's not as much on the line. And I think you saw yesterday that the Niners and the Chiefs really, really benefited. Obviously, the Niners have been through a lot of adversity the last several years with some of the big losses they've had, not being able to get over the hump. Uh and forever, a lot of people saying they can't come back. And they've kind of proven that wrong. Now, in the Chiefs, for the first time, they went from the sexy, unbeatable team to like, over the last couple of years, people... Now, I know they won the Super Bowl last year, but a lot of people last year thought like, is this team really that good? Are they really going to figure it out? 
And that definitely was the conversation this year because when you watched him during the regular season, Andy was right. That was a big wake-up call. That version of the Chiefs was not going to the Super Bowl. And the version we've seen these last couple weeks is not that version. It's the championship version. Speaking of championships, the Dan Campbell conversation is something that is just not going to slow down because everyone's going to have an opinion, and rightfully so. And I've gotten a lot of people on DMs. uh, I've just seen a lot of the conversation of, you know, everyone saying that you can't celebrate aggression and push aggression, and then when they get into a spot to be aggressive, then condemn it, then criticize it. And I say bullshit. And I said this to Colin, and I think I mentioned this on my podcast last night. Situations matter. They just do. What is the situation? What is the context of what you're doing? Right? In week six or week 10 or week 13, there's just not as much on the line when you have a good record because you're guaranteed you're going to the playoffs. You know, maybe seeding for sure is on the line. But if you lose that game up 10 going forward, if it ends up cost you, flips field position, that team beats you, whatever. It's not the end of your season. Even before a game starts, you go, I plan on being aggressive in this game. Totally understand it and totally agree. But the moment you get a multiple score lead in the second half, I'm sorry, everything changes. This is to this game, you win it, you are in the Super Bowl. And there is just, there's an hourglass on your side. It ain't full anymore. It is almost three quarters of the way gone. And the best way I can describe it, I was thinking about this, like if I gave everyone here listening just a million dollars, just a million dollars, and say, hey, you have to invest this. You can buy home. You can invest in the stock market. You can buy crypto. You can do whatever you want, but you got to invest in something. You can't just pocket it or, or buy you know, a bunch of clothes or whatever. You, you got to invest it into some asset. I bet a lot of people listening to this you know, might be relatively aggressive. Right, maybe you buy some cryptocurrency. Maybe buy a couple stocks here and there. Maybe you buy some a couple, you know, some rental homes. I don't know, but you would you would think about it, especially if you were relatively well off financially, and that money wasn't, especially if you were younger as well, wasn't going to change your life, change your change your family's fortune. It would help out, but I'm not allowing you to pay bills or anything with it. You have to invest it. I, I think a decent amount of people, especially younger, would would try some aggressive things, especially if I told you you couldn't touch that money for 20 plus years. So you would think long-term, you'd be aggressive. If I gave you $50 million, the context of everything dramatically changes. You might not be as aggressive with your investments if I gave you money that is astronomically higher. Why? You wouldn't want to lose that money. If you're making 500 grand a year and I give you a million dollars, if if you put it all on Bitcoin and Bitcoin ended up going to zero, it's not going to change your life. Right? But if I give you 50 million dollars, under no circumstances are you going to fuck up like 80% of it. You you might take 40 of that 50 million dollars immediately and put it into something safe. Like that is too much money to screw up. And the moment you get into a situation where there's a lot on the line now, There's a lot to lose. You could argue before the game, there was a lot to lose because you have the chance to go to the Super Bowl. But then you're up, and you're up big. And like I told Colin, you're not have the Niners against the ropes. They're holding on outside of the ring. You have the chance to kick them right in the face. And that would have been a field goal. Like, not everything is a big fourth and one conversion ends the other team. Sometimes it's just a math equation. And you have to pick your spots in life. I am pro 90% of the time being aggressive. Totally for it. But there are times when you can't act really aggressive. You're going to make out with your girlfriend at church, right? You might do it at a bar, though, on Saturday night. I mean, there's a time and a place for everything. And this notion that that's what they do, I don't think there's anything dumber in life if that's what I do, guy, never changes his opinion. In what world would you never change your thought process on things? 
I loved milk and yogurt growing up. Well, as I've gotten older, find out your lactose intolerant doesn't work as well. You don't eat it anymore. You don't put it in your body. I'm all for going for it on fourth down against the Chicago Bears in a week 14 game. In a game to, you know, where I'm up seven, I'll go up 14 instead of 10. Totally get it. In an NFC championship game, when you're on the road and you're kicking the shit out of a team and you kick the field goal, because this notion of all the percentages, a field goal at that at that spot is still a higher percentage than a 50-50 chance when, let's face it, he should have caught the ball. Guys drop the ball all the time. There are variables on any given play. What if your center false starts? What if your quarterback slips? What if your quarterback makes a bad read and throws a pick six? I mean, anything could happen. It's football. Everything's on the table at all moments. And this gets back to Dan Campbell against the Cowboys in the game they lost. It was like, well, he always goes for it. Totally understand going for it on that play that the ref screwed up. Now, to assume that if the ref wouldn't have screwed it up, the Cowboys wouldn't have covered a guy who was eligible, I think is an unfair assumption. But that's a topic for another day. But the moment everything gets screwed up and you get a penalty, despite being raging mad and you deserve to be, to continue to go for it at the seven-yard line, we jump the shark from being aggressive, which I always support, to being reckless. And being reckless like would be putting $50 million on Bitcoin. That $50 million might turn into a billion dollars, 100%. It also could turn into $7 million. And that would be considered by anyone with a brain as pretty reckless. And I thought Dan Campbell's decision was reckless because of what was on the line. And I do think what's on the line in the situation of a game really, really matter. And I think in the playoffs, you have to think twice about ways you did things in the regular season when you have a really, really big lead. Because a three-score game in that spot would have borderline ended the 49ers. They would have been in major trouble. And the Detroit Lions would now be in the Super Bowl. Here's the other thing. When situations like that happen, most fans are not reading the nerd on ESPN who is fully supporting that. If you go on Twitter, I I would imagine a lot of the analytical community really supports it, which I understand that they are um, you know, absolutist when it comes to numbers. I don't live in an absolute world. I live in a fluid world by people with a lot of variables. But the average guy, when they showed that visual at the uh, at the dome in which Detroit plays in, just views it like this is insane. This is crazy. We just lost the NFC Championship game. If we just would have kicked some field goals. Maybe we win the game. That's how they think. That's how the majority of people are going to think. And sometimes when you make a decision that costs you a lot, it's one thing costs a regular season game, whatever. You move on, you win the next week, everyone forgets about it. When something happens in the NFC Championship game, it's hard to shake that. It it, it really is. And I I just wonder, I'm a Dan Campbell fan. It's going to be fascinating to find out what happens to his coaching staff. So Schefter with McAfee says it's not a lock that Ben Johnson gets the Washington job, even though I've been hearing that from anyone, everyone, but maybe that's just everyone's just, you know, kind of group think once someone tells one person, one thing, they all just kind of repeat it. And that's where it may, maybe that's true. We'll, we'll find out. I just wonder how this will age if they don't have a fantastic season next year, because the bears in theory should be better, right? Caleb Williams, they they potentially upgrade at quarterback. They have the ninth pick. They could have an infusion of talent. Uh, obviously, the Packers, in theory, will be better next year than they were this year because their quarterback has more experience under his uh, under his belt. And just in general, anytime you win a division, you play a harder schedule the following year. So it just could be more difficult for the Lions. And even Dan Campbell admitted that. Like, there's no guarantee that we're ever back in this spot. I just wonder the way a fan base ever looks at you the same. Now, if next year they come back and they win this game, speaking of adversity, and they use it and they overcome it, then no one will give a shit. 
But if next year they're nine and eight and they miss the playoffs by a game, you just, this is where the dam kind of broke and people kind of start I, turning on you is the wrong thing because he's done an incredible job. He's been a badass. He, he really has taken that franchise. This is going to sound, I guess, shitty if you're a Detroit Lions fan. And I, I don't necessarily mean it to, but it's just the truth. One part of last night when I thought the Niners were going to lose in just, I mean, going to get blown out in the game. It's one thing to get blown out in a game. I mean, the Niners did last year. Well, they were playing the Eagles, and they didn't have a quarterback. To lose in the NFC Championship game to the Detroit Lions was going to be hard to shake for Kyle Shanahan. I know you guys are good, and you are. ton of players. I mean, half your roster could easily play for the Niners slash start. Like, you, you, your team is stacked. Like, it's legit. I'm a, I, I like watching it. Hell, I picked you to be really good this season. So it's not... This is an indictment on the actual 2023 version of your team. It's more the brand. Like the Detroit Lions are going to beat the 49ers as a massive underdog in the Bay Area. That That's a fucking terrible loss. And ultimately didn't happen. And I also think it's going to be on the flip side with these Lions fans going, we could have beat the 49ers. We should have beat the 49ers. And we didn't because our coach went for it when he could have just kicked a field goal and we would have been up 17 points with 20 minutes left to go in the actual game. Looking for a super offer for Super Bowl 58? DraftKings Sportsbook has you covered. New customers can bet on the big game and turn five bucks into 200 instantly in bonus bets. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now and use code JOHN. New customers can bet five bucks and get 200 instantly in bonus bets. Only on DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of Super Bowl 58, with code J-O-H-N. John, the crown is yours. I was thinking about this today because uh, the Lions and Niners game did 57 million people, which is just an astronomical number. I mean, astronomical number. I, I can't even... It's hard to even sum up how big that is. It's the biggest... NFL game, most watched NFL game since like 2011-12 season when the New York Giants, who have an enormous fan base, played the 49ers in that epic uh, game of candlestick in the rain. I think it went to overtime, if memory serves me correct. And the, the Giants went on to go to the Super Bowl and beat the Patriots. And I was thinking about like, why is the NFL even going up in popularity? And in 2024, it's in sports specifically, too many things don't feel like a big deal. Like, I enjoyed the Lakers uh, Warrior game. It's the first game, it's the most of an NBA game I've watched this year for sure. I watched the entire second half in both overtimes and was glued. It was, it was a fantastic game. But the NBA never feels like that. I mean, these are two of the most famous players, the two most famous players in the in the NBA, just having unreal games. It, it was awesome. It felt like it really mattered to both teams. That's how all football games feel, because most football games have implications that matter, right? And that's what one thing these other sports struggle with is no baseball game throughout 162 really matters that much till the end of the season. It's like must win to get the wild card spot. But like no game in the middle of June matters at all. And people, I think, I told Colin this, and I'm a big believer in it. I, I think the NFL has so many women watching right now that it's a huge addition to the sport. I think they have so many women. Like if you put the amount of women that watched those two games yesterday, they would outrate every playoff game for baseball or basketball yesterday. Right. And some of those are in groups, but like my mom does not miss a Chiefs game. She's from Davis, California. Right. She just loves Andy Reid and she loves the Chiefs. Right. And, and, and I think there's a, obviously the gambling has added to it. Uh, but, but I think the importance, the, the once a week nature of the sport has just led to, we live in a society where people like being part of big things. Right. And right now, football feels really, really big. And those other sports have just lost it. 
And yesterday, watching Patrick Mahomes or the 49ers game, like there's a communal aspect. I remember being a kid in the 90s. And I mean, you can look up some of the the epic legendary finales in just television shows, right? From even the 80s when I was really, really young. I remember my dad loves Cheers. I think like 95 million people watched the last episode of Cheers. Obviously, the last episode of Seinfeld and Friends and some of these shows were just absolutely massive. There was a huge communal aspect. Well, in 2024, you're watching Apple TV. I'm watching Prime Video. You're playing video games. I'm on my phone. Everyone's, it's so segmented. It's never been more segmented. I was thinking about this because I saw on Instagram a picture of like Blockbuster and then like kids in 2024 have no clue how fire this place was. At, at Friday night at seven o'clock. And it was true. Like when you would go into Blockbuster or whatever your local video store was called, the Blockbuster for me was downtown Davis. So we usually went to like Video City, but it was the same exact concept. In any time, the new big movie would show up and there would be, I don't know, maybe 50 boxes of that movie and you were just praying that they all weren't rented out. And the amount of people in your community you would see, like everyone was watching these movies. And it doesn't quite feel like that anymore. Definitely in sports, you know, and football has that still. And football feels like it's gaining steam. And I've said forever, football's not going to be on top my entire life. I've seen the ebb and flow of sports. Now, I don't see these other sports ever surpassing them because I don't see it humanly possible. Baseball, even though they've increased the pace of play, I don't think can ever resonate with the youth who is going to be ADD maxed out you know, with, with their ability to get bored fast. And I think basketball just has a huge, huge uphill battle, which if reports are correct that they're going to keep Adam Silver, I don't see anything changing anytime soon in terms of the interest in this country. But with football, I'm blown away by how many people care. I, I really am. And football's always been big. But the, the I, I truly believe the communal aspect is something it really has going for it right now. Uh, that these other sports just feel like they do not. Everyone wants to be a part of these big games. And like Colin said yesterday, and he's right, like Sunday's a huge benefit. Like most people aren't doing much on Sunday. And it's just an easy sport to consume. You don't have to watch it every night. I I have a lot of respect for people that like legitimately covered the NDA. Definitely baseball. Like I wouldn't even want to watch like Tuesday. Like I don't want to fucking watch this game. And I'm sure those guys sometimes don't want to watch those games either, but they don't have a choice. Because you're basically playing three or four t- nights a week. In baseball, sometimes you're playing five or six. And in football, it's it's actually the easiest sport to do this for a living. Because only one game. I, I really got all to stay locked in Thursday night, Sunday during the day, and then Monday night. It, it's, it's not that complicated. And uh, I, I think most of America agrees. The other thing is that Greg Olson, who I was thinking about this. This is no shot at Tony Romo. He's not necessarily my cup of tea in terms of a television personality. A little too cheesy. I I think he's fine. He's fine. I think Greg Olson's dramatically better. I, I really do. And I would put Greg Olson immediately in the, like the Collinsworth, Aikman. I would say John Madden's the greatest of all time. But just, he's really, really good. And reports are that Tom Brady is going to accept this job. I have no clue how Tom's going to be. Because if you watch Tom in the right situation where the cameras are on him, but he's not actually on camera. And he's just like bullshitting in a joint practice with Mike Vrabel. You're like, that's the Tom I want. But then you watch clips from his podcast. You're like, that's a little corporate Tom. And I think part of being good as a broadcaster, the media thinks that, you know, we educate the fans. Fans are watching this to relax. I want to be entertained. It's why John Madden was so popular. Obviously, quote unquote, educates, but I I, I want to be like smile on my face and enjoy the game. This goes back to the Lakers and Warriors. They fired Doc or excuse me Van Gundy last year because he was too crabby and often talked shit about the officials. You know one thing I liked about Van Gundy? A little bit of a wild card. Would say some crazy shit. I watched Doris Brooke, nice lady, met her. I used to have her on the radio show. She knows basketball. She's kind of boring. Like ultimately, these games are a television show, a.k.a. entertainment. And th- there's a level, like, Olsen's, like, pretty serious, but he's an easy listen. Him and Burkhart are really good. Tom, like, Tom is really famous, 
and obviously has a good personality if he just, or at least did back in the day when he was just hanging out, drinking beers with the guys or in the locker room. But that's not always the Tom we get. It's what makes Peyton such a special <clears throat> personality is he can kind of turn on the charm. He's kind of got this politician where it's just, he kind of has a little pizzazz to him. And, you know, Tom does, but I, I do think it's difficult when the camera's on now because he's just been hardwired to be this kind of robotic guy. Now, can he loosen up? Can he be good at it? Drew Brees, I knew couldn't. Tom, I don't know. Uh, <clears throat> but I understand Fox paying him a lot of money. Sucks for Greg Olson. From being the number one guy, he makes $10 million. To be the number two guy at Fox, he makes $3 million. Do you know what really sucks about that if you're Greg Olson? You're like, well, I've just been doing it, and you see how good I am. Now, part of it is he's on a he's on a product that's doing so many people watching, it's easy to justify paying the guy that much. You put him on the second game, there's just way less people watching, given it's not you know in the primetime window. But if you're him, you're like, you're going to do the same preparation. You're going to put the same effort in. You're going to be just as good. Uh, and you're going to make 70% less. <laughs> that, that would hurt when with the Eagles. On paper, their coaching staff hires were really good. And I knew they would be. Howie is really, really good at helping his coach out, identify good coaches. It's something that that organization takes a lot of pride in, uh, finding the best assistants and future coordinators and coordinators who are available and when they have needs, hiring them. That they Jeffrey Lurie will pay a lot of money to pay coaches, right? It's why they get so mad when the assistant coaches that a coach goes to bat for are not doing well. Because it's like, guys, I'll give you the money. One of the reasons the Warriors back in the day fired Mark Jackson, because they would beg him to hire these top assistants. They'd be like, oh, we'll cut the checks. And Mark Jackson just wouldn't. He just would hire his buddies. And Steve Kerr's the opposite, right? He'll just hire the best guys. And one thing with the Eagles is they've never hesitated. And that's why once they start struggling, you know the coordinators are in trouble, especially when they're kind of quote-unquote, I, I don't want to say no names, but guys that aren't have a long resume of success. So hiring Vic Fangio, even though that situation is a little bizarre to me, no-brainer. Every team in the league would want a Vic Fangio if they're willing to run the scheme. I think Kellen Moore, who's a guy who was an offensive coordinator for years with Dak Prescott. Pre-Dak Prescott injury, Dak was much more mobile and makes a ton of sense. Like Kellen Moore's success with Dallas, the Eagles saw it up close and personal for years in the division. Totally get it. Even Clint Hurt, the defensive line coach, for Fangio, who had been the defensive coordinator for a couple of years for Pete Carroll. Like those three guys have a lot of value in the NFLs. Obviously Fangio, but even Kellen Moore. But putting a coaching staff together is a little bit like putting a team together. Like the way something looks on paper, like this isn't baseball. You can't just, well, this guy, plug him in at third base, plug this guy in left field, this guy can hit, this guy's a righty, and it just doesn't really matter. Like you either can play the position and hit or you can't. In in football, the cohesion as on the field and on the coaching staff really, really matters. What do we talk about? I guess, I don't know if you listen, but me and Colin with the Chiefs. One thing they really, him and Andy Spags have been working together for 25 years. Matt Nagy and Andy have been together for a long, long time. Dave Tobe, the special teams coach, has been there the entire time. So the cohesion, you know what the other guy's thinking, they know what you're thinking, and everyone is on the same page. It's just very, very difficult. So I, I'm not criticizing these hires. These are the type, like, you got to do it. But just because you hire a really good staff doesn't mean that it's just going to work seamlessly, right? Part of the reason Shane Steichen and Sirianni worked really, really well, they have known each other for a while. They worked together with the Chargers. One thing I wonder with this is, like, Kellen Moore's a little bit of a wild card here. Like, ultimately, what's Sirianni going to tell Vic Fangio? So he, he was, if you're going to be the defensive coordinator for the Eagles, you're going to get to run the show. But when it comes to offense, listen, Sirianni can say he's going to be the head coach because that's what he is, but let the coordinator do his thing. If their offense starts to look a lot better next year, he's going to get no credit. And there's a human element of this, like your ego going to take a hit? How are you going to handle it? Are they going to work well together? Uh, just fascinating. It, it, it really is. And th there's going to be a ton of pressure on this team because how much they're paying the quarterback how just aggressive this franchise is. And like I said, 
I'm t- I totally understand, and, and I I applaud these hires. But just because you hire sweet names on paper doesn't mean that it's just going to be seamless and work. The other thing is there can always be resentment when when if something starts going well and the guy starts getting a lot of credit. Just something to keep an eye on. It, it, it really is. So Kellen Moore and Sirianni, how they come together and work together is going to be something, uh, obviously, in Philadelphia. But I think a, an NFL story that we're going to monitor very, very closely.